Um, okay, so for this image, I'm just going to get through these really fast, uh, but I'll, I'll try to cover the fundamentals as thoroughly as possible. Uh, what I see is an overdressing on the focal point. So focal point, focal point, focal point, focal point, especially because this is a bright spot against the black background. This is wrong. And I really wanted to look at it last Thursday, but um, I just couldn't. I didn't, I didn't do class. Uh, so what I'm going to do is refocus the focal point. I'm going to get dark and layer. And I'm going to just completely cover all of these. Now these are glowing glowing spells, so they are they have a right to glow. So there's at one point or another you're gonna have to break some rules. And there is a way where you can cheat these in here. I mean everyone, you know, sometimes you have a scene where there's a fireplace, but the focal point is still the guy sitting beside the fireplace. So how do you make it so that the fireplace doesn't take all the attention? Well you throw the fireplace out of the screen. So if you're a photographer you just simply don't include the fireplace in the photo. It's too bright. It's gonna attract all of it's gonna throw off the exposure. So what you have to do is do it so that the light source is outside of the image and if there are some embers floating around those embers will be caught so what you can do is have some of these just brighten up just a little bit so they have a right to glow you know they are spells but you gotta give them a minimal glow compared to the focal point and you really gotta grow and bloom the, blo the glow gotta grow and gloom gotta glow and bloom the glow on the focal point so the focal point is this mist right here, but do you see how intense it was before? I mean, she didn't even have a chance. She was fighting against a hundred other, a hundred other, not a hundred, like, like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, like, a, uh, more than ten focal points in the image, and that's what, that's what was really throwing off the light source as well, and the light source environment. I'm going to use dodge tool. You can go ahead and, and do this uh, more carefully, but because of uh, lack of time, I'm just going to use the dodge tool, and I'm going to raise the brightness. Another big thing I had with this problem, with this image, another big problem is the fact that you're using um, a really primary, a really uh, sort of low vocab kind of green. I don't know what you, I don't know if you guys know what I mean when I say low vocab, but it's a really simple simple green and there are so many greens at your at your disposal as the painter I don't know why you settled for this green you can have a blue green where it's a little bit more it's easier to match things with green is a very very difficult color to match especially if you have its warm version you have a very earthy green for stuff that's supposed to be glowing and spell like you don't do that what you do is you find a combination of blues and green so what I'm gonna do is get, get blue green and place it in the hottest part of each green so wherever it's most hot or wherever the glow is really happening that's where I'm gonna throw that it's still gonna look green trust me believe me it's still going to look green it's just not gonna be so green it looks like um, you know moss or mud or a swamp and it's since this is a spell this is a chemical reaction or something it's happening on the material level so what's what's where it's going to lead to is, is an off green, a more uh, chemical green. If you've ever seen like a flame from a Bunsen burner um, turn, is that what it's called, a Bunsen burner? Uh, when you put chemicals into the burner and then they change colors. Like if you've ever seen the green reaction, I forget which chemical causes that, but it's not pure green, it's like a blue green. It's like a really um, science-y kind of green. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce the blues, a different temperature for the green, a different attitude for the green so that we have less, we have more variety and less of a monotonous or a monochrome kind of atmosphere. So after I do that I also want to introduce another color so this blue I'm going to be introducing it into the background as well and I'm going to be just adding some of that blue I'm going to kind of just push. Remember, you have to stay in the range. So this is the wash. The wash has become a green, and it's a blue-green. So after I kind of just dim the background into a blue, and everything emerges with the green, so it's, it's the light sources that are green, it's the wash that is green caused by her spell, whatever kind of a witch she is. But still, it's still nighttime outside. So what I'm going to do is darken everything behind her that isn't directly exposed. So any parts of the spells that are behind her, I'm going to darken them so that she comes through and we have a separation between the background 
and the foreground. So this piece right here gets dark and this piece gets dark and because it's behind the foreground bit of the spells. So now we're creating depth like she's actually inside the spiral. You see that? Moving out. Just like this. And these extra bits you have around here, you really got to keep dimming them because they are taking all the attention away from her. Okay. I'm still just iffy about this. I mean, my favorite color is blue, but even when I use green, it's not just because I'm biased towards blue. It's because green just doesn't work in its natural form because it's a very yellowy green. It, it, it doesn't work like that when it's heated up. There's no, you know, in the real world, there's no equivalent of a hot green. So what we do is we bring in a cool tone into the green. What I'm going to do now is lower the values a lot because this is a this is a dark room lit up by m many tiny lights. So I'm going to darken the room just a little bit more and I'm going to bring back what I lost and I'm going to desaturate. This desaturation, you, this universal desaturation, allows me to saturate the focal point in a way where it, it, using the focal point, of sort of reinforcing the focal point with saturation. If everything else is desaturated, the focal point will be reinforced again. So you can have these brightnesses stay the same around her, they just can't have the exact same brightness she has. Or, no, not the brightness, the saturation that she has. I'm actually going to just show you the before and after now, and then I'm going to bring back what I erased. So before, after. So this feels like it's more in the night time. And the last thing I would do is because these are spells, I'm just going to give them that ember kind of glow. And then at that point, they'd be justified. You know, they're little glows or glowy spell thingies that are emerging from her spell, her, her R, her ultimate. <laughs> Dancing daggers, they would call it. And it would be OP in the first two weeks of release. And everyone would stop playing for a little while. <clears throat> this one's too bright, holy shit. Just gonna bring that down. And then when it comes to her, I'm gonna have to decide what kind of light is shining on her. So this is where I bring in that greenish white. I don't want her um, to, to kind of just fade off into into the whatever lights are around her, allowing her face to be visible. So I'm gonna use that greenish white to make her face a little bit more lit up and use that only on the areas that are the highest points. And please remember, boys and girls, do not put an extra little shadow between the eyes, uh, between the mouth and the cheek. That ages your character. If there was, if she had the kind of face where she had that delicate um, bump, it would not be visible under all this light. She would have to be laughing. If she is at a really neutral place in her face, where her face is just um, non-expression, very neutral, kind of in a trance like she is, um, her face would not be bending enough that unless she was old, then we'd see this naturally sitting there all the time. But it ages your characters, and these are pinups. Um, whether or not you like pinup, whether or not you want to do pinup, when we are doing a character portrait, um, showing off their power and their skill, that's basically a pinup setup that you have there. It's not a full body. Um, you are showing off the character's portrait. They're in some sort of a pose. It's not always like um, wearing sexy clothes that you have to have pinup. Pinup also refers to, you know, showcasing a character in their in their activity or whatever it is they're doing, especially if it's for like a Magic the Gathering card or for the, um, or for the, uh, Apple Bot, is that what they're called? The, I don't know what they're called. <clears throat> Those cards with the sexy ladies in them. Those are pinup, like, you know, sexy pinups, but it doesn't always have to be. And at this point, because the light is coming from her eyes, we really have to bring in some of that light reflecting on her eyes. So, on her bone structure. So we're going to have to bring some of that in there, some of that on the side of her nose. And then now if we compare, sorry, I'll zoom in. Now if we compare the before and after, do you see that extra bit that was making her face look very manly and very old? I just took that out and I darkened it toward a blue. Before you had everything competing for that for that focal point, you really have to decide what you want. And now you have a nice beautiful beautiful plate. You can go all the way up to white to no man's land. You can break that rule 
um, if you're breaking it consistently throughout, what I would do is I would just, I would go nuts. I, everywhere on her, on her person in this, in this centralized focal point area, I would start peeking the highlights and um, really dipping the shadows. Probably need to cast some sh cast shadows as well. So they probably need some cast shadows here. I'd put one on the neck. Some cast shadows on the side here from her hair. Onto objects <clears throat> from both sides. Maybe there's two lights on her. Um, this casting a shadow on that. So you so you are working on a masterpiece. Um, and this is what happens when we work on masterpieces without perfecting our knowledge of, uh, like, you know, thoroughly investigating what it means to have a cast shadow in an image, um, what it means to understand the light source, what kind of colors, what kind of greens we're using. And it's okay. Um, it, I'm not saying never try a full illustration. Try it just so that you can diagnose what you don't yet know. I think that's the best thing to do, is that using a, the masterpiece as a, as a means to... Um, understanding what your limitations are currently. But don't use it as, you know, expecting yourself to get hired by Blizzard because of this masterpiece. This masterpiece is not going to get you hired by Blizzard just yet. There's a lot of stuff you're going to have to perfect and, and be familiar, familiar with in your rendering in order to really get to that level. So even now, this green, I don't know, maybe because I just don't like green, I love blue. Blue is just fucking rock on color. I paint everything with blue. Um, but uh, I would probably work somewhere here where she is still green, but we still have like a balance. Or before it was just green, now it's blue and green. So I'm going to make her eyes the brightest point in the image. In order to check what the brightest points are, simply grayscale it, a black or a white, um, a pure black or pure white on a color color image and you'll know exactly what's the brightest spot. Um, what you don't want to do is uh, put her in a silhouette state. The light is shining on her so just uh, gray out anything behind her. <clears throat> Alright, so that's the brightest point in the face right now and that's really good. That's good news. We want that. We want that to be the brightest spot on the face. That's the focal point. That's what we're looking at. That's the character that we're showcasing. So a little bit of brightness on the lips. Peak there. So remember, how dark is the room? What's the focal point? And just please don't overage your characters. Like there's no need for you for you to use that prop, that tool, that that this and this. There's no need for you to use that on a young sorceress. There's no need. It really after a while you start realizing I have no use for that article on the face because it it it, it does more than it gives. Um, and uh, it, it, it takes away from the beauty, it takes away from the triangle. It prematurely ages your character, um, and you're going to have to, every time you draw that character, you're going to have to bring in that cheek. Don't paint it in blindly. Don't paint it in like, uh, just because you feel like painting it in. Painting it, paint it in with purpose. If you really want her to be old, I mean, this is what I do with my, with my girls. I, I sort of give them this. I love these cheeks. I, I love that little line here. But I also give them this. I age them on purpose, and I and I sort of age them universally. It's I'm not just gonna put that there. Um, if you've seen my recent painting, this is exactly what I did. I actually had to age her back a little bit because she had too much age. Um, people who critiqued it on Facebook told me that it just looks too, a bit too old, and I agreed with them. She had, she did have a little bit too much uh, age to her, and not until I lightened this part of the cheek did she stop looking like she was a 45-year-old's head on a 20-year-old's body. So remember, you don't want to prematurely age your character, um, especially if everything else is hinting to the fact that they're young. And uh, I think that's it. So before really earthy green. Uh, it, it had no place there. Like It's a really specific green. Almost, I feel like it was an accidental green that you were working with. It's it's really washed out. All of these areas are washed out. So what I would do after all of this is bring the shadows down way low because what happens in areas of severe light is severe contrast. So the darks are darks, darks are dark, and the lights are light. And I would, um, I would emerge this, since the light is going up, I would darken the bottom even more until it reaches like a depth. Just like that. I would darken it even more. 
remember the outsides, the, the outskirts of your, of your painting are not important. They're there just to complete the canvas. They are not the, the soul of the character here. All right. And if you want to do anything else to her person, you just add a glow to her. Stop, stop wasting time on stuff that isn't, you know, POI. So I would probably get, no, I would probably get soft light <clears throat> with that blue or that green. Obviously I'm choosing blue and I'm just going to paint like a glow around her to separate her even further from the background. Try to, try to make this glow work with her form so don't, don't let it wash out anything but also don't let it be too dim. What I usually do is kind of just give it a limit. It doesn't cross past like the hair. Something like that. And it has like absorption points. Absorption lines. So bits that are a little bit dimmed out. So just a couple of, you know, a little bit of a glow will really separate her from the background. You can go ahead and make that any color you want. Uh, I recommend like a, a green blue. Okay. So again, don't make it a washy, washy color. So very washed out, brightness everywhere, face is a little bit aged, um, uh, focal point isn't focused after we've kind of just refocused everything. You want to go back to pure green, go ahead, but it's really mossy green. It's like she's fighting in like a, a sandstorm in a, in a swamp. <clears throat> it doesn't feel like the pure color, like the pure version of that color in its hottest form and in, in a spell state. So I would, I, would, I would change it to this if I were you. Okay, so getting rid of that. <clears throat> now for this piece. This is I'm gonna look at this for one reason, and it's that we forget to darken the background. The room that we are in decides what kind of light source. Really, the light source decides what, how bright the room is around us. So when you're painting on a grayscale, don't just you fail me, you fail me, magic wand, you fail me. do it, I believe. What we forget is that when we're painting with it in a grayscale, we, um, oh my god, I'm sorry. We forget the room is also what we're painting, the, the room surrounding the character. So, I'm sorry, I can't think right now, I'm just so mad at, <laughs> at Magic Wand. Okay. So we need to darken this so that makes sense. I would darken it until this point. And we, you see how bright it was before? It was too bright considering that the light source was casting this sharp a shadow on the face. And then after that you need to decide um, how everything, how bright everything is going to be. What's the value compared to everything? So I would light and stuff this way. If this is some smoke, the smoke smoke is transparent, translucent. Not really translucent, but it, it's um it's a very thin coat over whatever's in the background. So it does not completely opaque opaquely cover up the, the whatever's behind it. It starts thick and just tapers off and that's you should keep it on a separate layer. Smoke, embers um, all kinds of material or matter disturbances in, in the air or some sort of color or, or silk or flowing fabric, all of that stuff that requires transparency, like fog, goes into its own layer. We are working digitally, so if you are doing it on a traditional painting, you leave that last. Alright, so please don't forget the value of how dark your background is. <clears throat> it changes the light environment. It starts to make it, you know, make sense. And treat everything like a form study. This is a pyramid, so one and a half is going to be darker. As for the hand gestures, they're a bit vague and a bit stiff. So I recommend something that's a little more loose, like something crazy with loose elbows. Always loosen the elbows. If you guys don't loosen the elbows and the hand gestures of your drawings, um, and your portraits, whatever it is, it will look very stiff. If the elbows are always tucked in so nicely, like look at how 
close to the torso, the elbows are. It's actually uncomfortable to do that. Like everybody just tuck your elbow into the sides. Like what are you gonna? What can you do? You feel like a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex because you've removed all um, movement, you know, and your, you know, all the all of the capacity and for your like your hands are capable of um, in movement. So your arms, I mean. So remember when you're drawing <clears throat> arms, you really need to think about how loose the elbows need to be when you're drawing them. Okay, so before, it just made no sense. The room was so bright, it looked like a study. You know, this is what we do with studies. We keep it a neutral background and we study whatever, but sometimes when we're working on an illustration, we really have to darken. And now you see, now you have areas where you can, pockets that you can really darken. Actually, let's just see what this does. Ooh, looks like pixel art. <clears throat> these areas you can really darken and mess around with. I would actually start the darkening of everything. The darkening sounds like an M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> movie. I would start darkening everything on the dark spots, the main areas, the focal points. These are the areas that I would really start. And I'm talking like the deepest part of them. I'm not talking about the whole area. Just the deepest bits. Just like that. And then zoom out, test, and then go to the next area that is just as dark, that's still around this radius. Remember, 100% and everything is less in percentage until it reaches like half of that. So 50% rendering of what you've already rendered here. <clears throat> so all of, the, all of the potential for contrast, all of the detail, all of it is at 100% here in the focal point, and it's a, it steps down the ladder. The further from the from the focal point we move, you cannot have crazy rendering on some random part of the rib cage or some random part of the hip over here with the same amount of contrast, you know, as the face. It's, it doesn't work like that. And my voice is starting. I sound like a boy. I recommend, this is a very, like a plain looking um, shroud or, or a cloak, I recommend something a little bit more intricate. All you really have is the skull, so I, I recommend some beautiful kind of studies for fabric just, um, just around here. <clears throat> Maybe old and raggedy and caught in, a, in an inner wind that way. You'll have a little bit more for your audience to look at. It's a cool concept. It's really cool. These kinds of things never fail. You know, it's dark. It's got a skull. It's got a cloak, and it's a dark room. It's cool to look at. It looks like a card from some sort of, you know, fantasy world or something like death or, I don't know, resurrection or some shit. Or a tarot card. And then you can really, um mess around with the symmetry, sort of like a holy kind of symmetry kind of setting. <clears throat> okay, so that's what I recommend, really darkening the room up. I'm going to take away the stuff I added. Okay, big fat arrows before, after. Alright, please remember how dark the room is. It needs to be as dark as you're saying. It is. This is a it adds drama. Um, here, this is a 14-day challenge, I think, but I wanted to cover something. This is beautifully drawn. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of the other issues I see. I'm just going to talk about this one specific issue, and it's it's sort of a a nod to um, what I talked about earlier with the cheekbones. If you don't want, if you don't end up adding this, and you want to connect the highlights, you connect the highlights on an angle. So this whole lip area seems like it's really dented in. What we have to do is build up the high point of the cheeks. So I'm shrinking my brush as I do this. And I'll show you in a second what that did to the anatomy. Just have to make sure I'm just darkening where it needs to be. Okay. So it might not be done. So I always hear that response. It wasn't finished. Um, but still, if you're rendering at the eyelash level, you miss this core light. So please remember that half the face 
is always going to be in a beard, like a like a darkened, or is it half that's darkened? The inner side here gets darkened, and then the upper side at the top, right along here, is all light that travels. So you had it right, you had that on switch properly. All right, so let's look at the before. After. You see how the way you built the cheeks is now complemented by the way the lips stick out. So before it was like the lips were flat. And there was no half shadow on, on the on the there was no beard. And when light comes in from the top, when you when you think about the face from the side, that's really where you you know you get you see the answer. The face does the nose and then the mouth. So we see that the mouth in different kinds of faces is different. Sometimes the mouth is more than the forehead, sometimes the forehead is more than the mouth. Um, something like that. But uh, the mouth is what the upper lip area is one of those areas that is directly exposed to the light but it has a peak. It has the highest point. That highest point is where I allowed that brush to shrink and travel across this bridge here. And even when you break that highlight, even when you do this, you still have to keep that highlight there because the lips stick out. The lips just stick out like a snout or like a fish lip. They stick out on their own. And just look at a face from the side and you'll see that sometimes we miss these essential little bits that change the change the geography of the face. Now it felt like her face, her mouth was sinking in way deeper than like let's see the value here. The value here was shared almost in similar value to here, which is a real depression. The mouth is not that intense of a depression. It sticks out. It's one of the light spots. If this was, uh, you know, if we shown a light, well, the last couple areas that would be lit up, like if there was a single light, and we'd have those really, really long shadows, the lips would be one of those areas that would still be illuminated along with the nose and the forehead if we had those really really long shadows those kinds of light that the light that comes from above the chin would have a little bit the, the mouth would have a little bit but the cheeks here these are these are actual peaks in the face so don't forget that when you're drawing the last kind of bits to to lose their form in a deeply dark room, those are the areas that are illuminated first. So the highest peaks. <clears throat> okay, so let's kind of just stay in, stay in topic. Um, this room right here is too dark. So again, people aren't really thinking about the room that they're drawing. What we really need to do is imagine it like the light is there revealing to me the face how am I seeing this face if the room is so dark? That's the question you kind of ask yourself. This this room here is too dark, and we're, when we're not thinking about the room, oh, mode, RGB. When we're not thinking about the room, we forget that 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 face is illuminated because of the light that's so strong in the room that it's revealed such soft shadows. If it was a tiny little candle, if it was a dark room, let's search up a reference actually, so you guys can build up your visual library. If it was a like dark room holding candle, <clears throat> we have really, really long, long scary shadows. So this is not right. <laughs> The candle isn't going to reveal this. This is another light coming in. There we go. These are the kinds of lights we get if the room was dark and there's a single candle or there's some sort of torch or a fireplace. We get long ass shadows. Right? If it's a, you know, if it's a, a moderately, so grayscale portraits. If it's a dark, like this, this is pretty dark, but this is this background is actually really, really dark. It's not allowing a lot of light. But look at this one. This one's a pretty medium colored background. And we're having bright, but not no man's land brightness on the face. It's really nicely exposed. This is the kind of lighting I always want you guys to work in. This is the same thing. 
it's a bright light soft soft shadows there aren't severe sharp sh shadows especially if you're painting females you don't want to have it so that the light source is unbelievably sharp causing really really sharp shadows this is so cool and her face right now is this bright because they've actually brought in an external pigment and allowed it to peak they painted her face white she she has been painted this is not her natural skin tone because the room is pretty dark because they wanted these deep darks if they had raised the brightness of the room even brighter they would not get this amazing silhouette so remember the room plays a big part in how soft the shadows are so this right here the light is very distant from her face but still they're not that sharp they're still pretty soft and the light is distant at an angle so we're seeing this this kind of shadow but it's not so much that it's flooded away the most important bits of her features and if we're seeing this much of her feature, the, the room has to be pretty bright. So if you look at the background before, it was it was dark. I feel like half her face should have been in darkness. There should have been some sort of uh, cast shadow on her nose. But now I don't really worry about that because the room is bright enough that it has diffused all the sharpness in the shadows. And all we need are just soft climbs <clears throat> like this. Sorry if my voice breaks. Let me see what everyone's saying. Could you express the relationship of the background to our study? It's not just gray, but a light source. No, um, uh, it's not a light source. It's it's also affected by the light source. If the room has become so bright in the background, or if you're painting an object that has reached a certain kind of light light color, that means the room must be affected as well. A light is massive. A light is the god of your image. It affects both both the room within which your object exists and your object. Uh, you guys paint like this. You guys paint as if you have all, only two dimensions. You need to paint as if you have three. As if there is an empty room within which this object hovers and is suspended. It means that there are walls all, ar all around that are also being illuminated. If you think like that, you'll never skip on secondary light source. You'll never skip on defuse. You'll never um, skip the, the 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 contrast ladder because you'll know the distance between the object and the light, and its distance from the walls and whatever is defusing whatever. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, it's a study. It's a great study, but please don't forget that the background plays a big role so here you can get away with this because it feels like she has her own light source um, because this is kind of sharp right around here but the only thing I really wanted to cover here is that the eye I could just I could fix this whole beautiful painting just by doing this <clears throat> I need to hide away that eye because that eye can simply it's simply not visible it will hide just like that behind the other one. Look at how deep this one is. Look at how much it has to travel before it reaches the high point of the side of the nose right here. But then this one is already sticking out all the way, way past this point. It has to travel. Like if there was an ant and the ant had to travel up, there's a long climb before it gets to the top of the nose. So it means the eyes are pretty far away. So this is what I feel like her eyes should be doing instead. So before, really, really just relieved and that's not good. It's not expressing the, the depression that are the, the, the eye sockets. Okay. So when you're doing three quarter view, remember there's a, a significant amount of stacking you have to express. You can't just ignore that. <clears throat> don't paint eyes. Everyone repeat this back to me. Don't paint eyes in front view in a three-quarter view. Don't paint front view eyes in three-quarter view. It's never going to work. There is compression. If you guys aren't compression and, and compressing and stacking, you're not painting three-quarter view. Um, okay, for this one, the person was saying they saw something, but it, they didn't really know what it was, and it was kind of like an issue. It's really the symmetry line. Before, the eye was pretty far away from the nose symmetry line, so the vertical symmetry and the horizontal symmetry. The eye was pretty far away, and I'll show you in a second where it was. So we're flipping the canvas. <clears throat> and I'm just trying to match this. Yep. 
feather out the edges so I can make it fit in. Right. Before, after. This is matching it to, to the nose. So whenever you don't know what to do with the eye, you simply just think about the symmetry line right across the nose. That's what I'm seeing in my head right now that's guiding me around where to place this eye. So you, some of you might have to you know, practice a little bit before you see it just in your mind. So we can see how there's so many asymmetries here. The lip is completely outside of the symmetry. Not just outside of the symmetry, but it's tilted off the horizontal symmetry. Because your eyes are what guide the horizontal symmetry, they set, set up the, the sort of stage. So when your eyes are off, your lips are going to be off too. Everything is going to be off. The base of everything here was just a little bit off. This is a minor three-quarter view, so there needs to be some compression on one side, so I'm compressing the other side. Oops. And I'm pushing it down, and then there needs to be a, a rotation so that this symmetry line I created with like using it on the nose, I'm bringing everything back toward where it belongs. Why did I group this? Oops. <clears throat> All right, so before on the lips, after. There needs to be even more of that. Before, after. Before, after. And if I merge both of these, before, after. So that's kind of what was causing the issues here. I would, I'm going to make the lips as big as you made them before. So I can honor that choice you made. But when you don't think about symmetry, this is basically what happens. You paint something so well rendered, so beautiful, so delicately met blended, and you lose and you miss, you lose points on little issues like this you could have fixed if you had just um, thought about you know, planned a little bit more, and um, just with a little bit more organization at the early stages of your painting. A couple of lines do the trick. So before, after. Right? Do you guys see that issue? You don't get away with this when you're, when you're working for, for AAA companies, let me tell you that. You guys have to get this stuff just like that. You cannot make these kinds of mistakes if you're planning on building your artistic career um, in the industry and you really want a strong portfolio. Issues like that, symmetry, tiny little issues like that that are never supposed to be, that, that aren't supposed to be issues that you have, that you, these weaknesses, you're not going to be forgiven for them. You're going to be punished for them. So planning a little bit goes a long way for your portfolio, especially, and I know you're using this for your portfolio, I know you might use it, you might finish it, because look at how finished it is, it's so beautifully rendered. You would use it for a portfolio. You should. But not before you fix these tiny little issues that stick out like sore thumbs because they're so well rendered, they will show. If this was cartooning and it was like some sort of... Um, you know, like really, really cartoony style that was based off cell shades, you wouldn't see this issue right away. There, w there would be time before you saw that issue, but because this is so well rendered, our eyes relate to it on a different level than we would with cartooning. This is realistic, so we take it seriously when we look at it. So let me show you one before and after. Before, after. It's all about that symmetry line, the vertical and the horizontal. It's just mirroring it. It's so simple. It's just about mirroring it. Okay. No problem, Lena. Thanks for being here. Um, don't paint front view eyes and three-quarter view. Yes. Um, the neck doesn't seem to be connected to the head correctly. Yeah, there are a lot of issues. I don't have time to cover them all, but this is pretty, pretty well blended, pretty well rendered all around. Um, all right. So what? What? Uh, actually, never mind. I'll ask it at the end. Cancel. Flatten. This. So, so, so the way to never allow yourself to um, draw front view eyes on three quarter view is just to remember that it's no longer symmetrical. So how can you possibly paint symmetrical eyes on an essentially asymmetrical rotation? Like an, it's a complete, you are not, one side is further away from you than the other side. You cannot paint symmetrical eyes on an asymmetrical setup. Write that back to me. <clears throat> 
front uh, three quarter views are not symmetrical all right just just remember that bit one part is in the background and one part is in the foreground it's, it's not even on the same levels anymore it's not even the same distance between the cheekbone on the left and the cheekbone on the right that is closest to you it's uh, it's a if you do more form studies you you would get that right away it would click it's not just about learning how to paint eyes in three-quarter view. It's a little about learning the geography, learning about the landscape, what's really happening. There's now a background. Front view, painting front view eyes is so easy because everything is the same distance away from you. This is three kilometers away, this is three kilometers away, and everything else is. When you have three-quarter view, now there's a background for the face. Now the face has a background and it's the same face. You know, that's called rotation. If you're having trouble rotating three-dimensional objects in your mind, you'll have trouble rendering three-dimensional objects in a three-dimensional space. It's that simple. Um, one issue I wanted to talk about for this piece um, is the framing. Her cloak, and she's pretty, pretty much the most intricate piece in this entire painting, is completely cropped out, so we need to do something like that. And then again with the cheek, with this, it aged her. It aged her it was an unnatural age added to her. If you want her to look cute, we get rid of that. All right, and we do. Trust me. Trust me, we do want her to look cute. Look through all of the League of, League of Legends splashes. Look through all the Apple Bot, um pinups. Look for all the look look through all the Magic the Gathering pinups for females. They all look like the same girl. Everyone always complains commenting on my videos saying you're always critiquing the images and you're always making them look like the same girl. The industry wants the same girl guys. The industry wants the same girl. Believe me, they want that same old cute face. You can dress it up, you can give it some scars, but if you want to have a successful portfolio that's going to be hired for some sort of production for for any production, um, you're going to have to learn that universal beautiful Barbie face. You can, you can adjust it by all means for your personal work, even if they want something adjusted, go ahead. But it's all the same girl and one of the biggest things you never do, and I'm always talking about this, are the laugh lines. Don't use them if you don't have to, and you really, really don't have to on a cute little princess girl with a moose pet. Like, you don't have to. Alright? You don't have to use it. <clears throat> I would just raise the value of the skin one more level, actually, and move the slider up to yellow, because the light source is so warm. And I will do the exact same thing I did with that three quarter, I mean that 14-day that challenge, and just raise the high point this way. So this part, yeah, it does have a shadow, but the shadow starts from the nose. And it's so slight a shadow, you should not be adding a whole laugh line just for that. Well, let's take a, bef a before and after. Before, just look at the face. Look how old it looked. And after, much younger. Okay. Actually, I'll do that a lot better so you can just see. The head is also a little bit small. So before, after. You just added age really for no reason. Before, after. Beware of that. The head is also a little bit short. She feels um, a little bit like she has a five-year-old's head on a 20-year-old's body. The way to age a face is just to lengthen it. That's all you gotta do. You just gotta lengthen the face. I don't know why it's not letting me do that. Oh, there we go. So before she looked a little bit like a kid, right? Like in, like a toddler. After we lengthened her face. And if you want to add age even more to a face, all you gotta do is bring in those cheekbones. So you, you keep the bulge of the cheek, so babies have the bulge of the cheek right here. That's what makes them babies. Their, their skeleton hasn't fully grown in. But with females that are grown, fully grown, you want to keep the peak at the cheekbone right under the eye. That's the most delicate spot where it's not too bulky and then everything moves down toward the chin. And I'll show you the before and after how much like a baby it looked, especially with those laugh lines because babies have laugh lines. Okay, now she looks a little bit like she has less of a small head. And using the light source as actual color. So go in there, drop tool the light source, and use it on her face. Because that's exactly what happens in real life. The actual light source color changes the color of the, of the face itself. 
All right. So beautiful job with this. I love how you finished it. I, I do appreciate when you guys try and push for masterpieces. But again, masterpieces show you what you don't know how to do yet. Show you what you're not doing right yet. <clears throat> Something that, you know, stuff that you need a couple more weeks on just to wrap your head around it. Basic portraiture rules, basic room rules. But altogether, the room is the beautiful color. It's perfect color. The wash is blue, but the light source is warm. It's, it's just so well done. The reflections here are the perfect temperature. I love everything about this. It's just the face was a little bit young for me. Um, and you were using, you were misusing that cheek line. Be careful of that thing. It will age your characters. And you don't want that. You want to be in control of the character you're designing. You don't want to accidentally design something else. Um, for this piece, it was mostly a co color correction. I had trouble with because right now up here in this whole half up here you have a white a red wash really really like a sienna color and down here you've got a green and you know those two don't mix they don't they're not friendly they're not on speaking terms so what we do is we we balance all of the other colors to match the colors around the focal point because those are the colors that are ruling everything so this still looks green but not as green as before which is a little bit cool this is generally a warm scene, like there was a filter on here. Look at all the shadows here. They all seem to be going through the same filter. So match that filter everywhere else in the image, even on the background. Is that what it's called, a sienna color? Is that what, um, did I use that wrong? Is it, is it sienna? Is it sienna a car? <laughs> there is a color that, which, what's the color called? It's like some sort of filter. I don't know. Um, also, you have these really sharp shadows here. I need to see those same kinds of shadows used here for me to be convinced that this light environment is the same everywhere else on the painting. So I'm pulling this. Whoa. I'm pulling this all the way. Cast shadow there. Cast shadow there cast shadow there. There's some real cast shadows happening here, so we need to unify them all. Sienna, is it burnt Sienna? Magenta? Yeah, John Cena. <laughs> Alright, so these cast shadows here are really going to do it. Also, this, this is not a flat piece of paper. It's like fabric, so it's got three-dimensional shape to it, so it will have a side to it. This will have a side to it. Just like that. Um, maybe they're emerging. You know what would be really cool if you could do this? If they're emerging out of a shadow of a door. And what's happening is that their face is still under that shadow. Something like, okay, I fucked up. Let me fix it. Actually, the face would be relieved way earlier. They're like just pulling their head right out of the place where they were hiding because they're a sexy assassin. <clears throat> so darken. Ooh, that looks nice. And you know what? Um, you can uh, you can blur this, gosh, and blur, because it's not going to be that sharp. You can keep that cool. And then, guess what? Saturation tool. You can get that burnt sienna again, right here, and run it right across the shadow edge. Oh, I love this effect. Oh, on color layer, sorry. I love this effect right here. Ugh, ugh, that's so nice. I'm just gonna cry. Right on the edge of the of the cast shadow, we have a red line, and this is just because the temperature is different, revealing different values on on the fabric it's causing. Also, the sun does this. But look at that. <clears throat> I love how you accept your fuck-ups. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, and then down and then finally where the sun f initially hits her face, that's where I would want to add in some crazy highlight right along the edge of her head. But only on the side of her face that's really being exposed. And then I would get a soft brush and create that bloom. 
right along here. Now that is a yes, right? Can I get a yes, yes? Right here. Look at that. So before you see what I was saying about those cools, everything wasn't matching. You know what would be really cool is if you got your saturation tool again, which is the sponge, sorry about not being specific, and really made their eyes um, as bright as possible. And uh, you know the bits in their eyes right here, the whites? Make those the blue. So now you have a real clash. Now you have the cools where they belong and the warms where they belong. But that filter you had before wasn't, wasn't universal. Right? And now we made it universal. Now we have a universal light environment. Nothing is bothering me about this anymore. Make these corrections to load into your portfolio and you'll see the reaction from your viewers. Another thing you really want to do is... Um, is if there's anything metallic, that will brighten up as well. And not just brighten up, it'll have a glow to it. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> okay. It's like Alice Gone Wire with this. Yeah, it's about drama. It's about remembering the rules, remembering material. So this right here would be really cool if you just continued illuminating that. This is a material, so it's justified that it spikes into the no man's land. Right along here. And I would actually bring down the sepia on that. I would just keep it kind of silver, because that's the material it is. Alright. So before, after. Okay. As for the face, it's beautiful. Um, the nose does uh, kind of just smudge at the very tip where it's most distant. This tip is the furthest from here, so that's when it gets fuzziest. Cast shadows fuzz up the further they get from the object, and we just have to find the darkest bit, and that's what we're fuzzing up. Excuse me. Um, I've been fighting back and forth this whole time. <laughs> um, and... Uh, you know, don't forget your cast shadows. Those are like, they're they're just too delicious to forget. They are life. They are the meaning of life. That and poutine. All right, you're casting shadows here. There's no reason why you shouldn't be casting them here. And we remember cast shadows on the face before we remember cast shadows anywhere else. Because we're like that. We draw faces symbolically. We memorize everything. We draw faces more than we draw anything else. But what study do I do to make me better at cast shadows? Form studies. Do one every day, God. And just do them every day. Just, just do it, man. You're going to have to one day. One day you're going to have to. So just start now. <laughs> And remember, the shirt is white, so the cast shadow won't get that dark. It'll be white, because the, the shirt itself will defuse the shadow as it happens. The side of the tie will get some light before it, it gets um, before it gets illuminated. Might get a little bit of extra, because it's uh, silk. Just the side right here, we'll get the same amount. And then blur it away, of course, because it can't have the same sharpness as the face. This also needs to be blurred. <clears throat> Actually, this travels down all the way. There's so much fun and so much ways, so many ways you can dress up your beautiful canvas with cast shadows. If you don't know how to do cast shadows, get on it. Your future depends on it. Your future self from five years from now will thank you for finally having the balls to try some cast shadows. Now just frame the canvas even further. The arm looks a little bit stiff. I'd have to, my elbow would have to be right in front of my chest in order to get my hand to fit in the canvas like that. So maybe try a different way where we see the front of her hand instead of the thumb. The thumb would be hiding. All right? So before, after. Drama. And now if you want to just 
mess around, you can because the canvas is universal now. The wash is universal. I like where you had it before with the hair. It's really cute. You can do anything now because everything is balanced. And the eyes are are, are, are the opposing, so you're always going to get the opposing color. Alright. Flatten that. Save that. And that's it. <clears throat> What's everyone saying? Um, he, she mentioned that, uh, that too, but no one holds a gun like that. I'd love this print on my wall. It's lovely. Yes, I know. It's so cute. Unless it's like a gun advertisement or something. <laughs> uh, oh, you like my voice. Thank you, Hi Thirdell. I'm happy my voice is, is nice. <clears throat> I don't know how I feel about people talking about my voice anymore because I recently got my voice complimented and the <laughs> same person called me a hack within 24 hours. So I don't know, within 48 hours or something. So um, I hope my voice um, stays nice to you. The index finger is making me feel uncomfortable. What? How do you call? It? How is that a critique? You got to give us a reason. I mean, it, it, you know, you're, the, you gotta, you gotta do something else with that. This is about to eat this picture. She loves it so. <laughs> um, the first time caught me live. Uh, welcome, Danny. It's nice, to, nice to have you here. Um, how many are new here? Because I know a lot of you are subscribers that just happened to catch me. Um, I thought it started at five thirty. Did I say five thirty? No, it was 5. Did I say 5.30? Oh my god, did I say 5.30? Um, why is it saying the stream quality is bad? Um, one second, I think someone's playing Resident Evil in my house. Alright, so I don't know why the streaming is bad. It's saying it's bad. I don't know if you guys are getting bad quality right now. Um, let's see if anyone asked any questions. <sighs> Always back to law. Yes. Any any of the major, um, you know, places where they're really investing a lot of time into the art and games, those are the areas I'm going to bring up. And League of Legends, Riot, um, Wizards of the Coast, they spend a lot of money and a lot of time perfecting the art in their productions. And that's where we want to end up being. That's where we want to work. Um, if, if, I don't, I don't, I don't personally want to work in a studio. It's too much stress. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for those who want to. Let's see what everyone is saying. Do you think changing the color would alter the effect of the painting? Absolutely not. It would enhance it. Um, darn it, daylight saving times. Oh yeah, daylight saving. Uh, around the daggers should be more rounded. The ellipses around the daggers. This is for old stuff. Okay. Uh, it's good for me to change the settings, so it's okay. Yes, on the community too. Also, I was just realizing my clocks went back. Uh, what's 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 on the community? Oh oh, I said at five thirty. I'm so sorry. It must have been a pre-made, a pre-made thing. I'm so sorry. That was my bad. I'm so sorry. Barry White? What about Barry White? <clears throat> it's picking at the tricking and not resting over it. Oh, 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 oh. that's why. <laughs> um, your voice is super cute when you're excited. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Everyone likes my voice. Watch when I become like 30. Like after I hit 30, my voice will start to deepen and, and get more like you know, old lady voice, so, because of how much I talk, like, I talk every day for, like, five hours, six hours, because of teaching, so, you know, my voice is going to blow out soon before anyone else is, or maybe it'll strengthen, you know what, I don't know. <clears throat> how much time should be spent on a project? If it's a full, uh, by the way, this is Q&A time, so you guys can ask me some questions. If it's a full illustration, um, you should you should be spending a lot of time on planning, and that should be like three hours or something. Then you should set up, you know, what you're going to render first. What's the stuff you want to get out of the way? I render the hard stuff first, and leave all that crazy stuff for later. Or I'll plan the costume and then leave it for later, or plan the landscape or whatever it is I'm drawing, and then I'll get into rendering. Rendering should be what you're spending the most time on, but you should not be rendering without planning behind you because then you'll waste too much time. 
So like three days, six hour sessions to finish a, a, a masterpiece is where I'm at right now. You guys might be a little bit longer. You guys, Some of you might be a little bit shorter than what I do. Um, it's just about how you work. Uh, Laith asks, Isabrak, are you self-taught or not? And if so, where did you go to school? Um, I did not go to school. I went to school for English Lit. Um, I, I am self-taught. I just studied from home. Hopefully you don't lose subs when your voice goes. <laughs> when my voice goes, I'm going to start showing my face and, and wearing low-cut shirts, and then my subs will go back up. Not really. We get daylight savings on the 27th. Oh. <clears throat> Ista smokes two boxes of cigarettes a day to get such a smooth voice. What? <laughs> I don't smoke. How much room do AAA companies have for new members in the industry? Um, that's growing. Uh, very little room, so I've heard. But there are companies that are not AAA that are just below that that are more than happy to hire um, growing artists because there's a greater and greater demand. Um, for new and innovative art styles, it, that's the thing that's lacking in the is industry. Innovative art styles. There's you're 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 either producing the same old shit, you're getting the old uh, you're getting the old um, concepts, and you're just adding to them, or you're stuck in the same style for your game. People want new art. People want something that looks new and fresh. And a lot of indie games are now doing that, and the AAA and anything less than that are trying to compete with indie game uniqueness and art. So the best thing right now for you, if you want to get hired, isn't how many times you've worked with a AAA company. It's how unique what you're bringing in that could possibly lead you to becoming an art director. So it's about the uniqueness of your art, really, that's going to get you your foot in the door for the future. Um, the comic book, book industry isn't going down anytime soon. Neither is uh, concept art for games and movies. So what we want to see, what they want to see most of the time, are new styles that are fresh, but they still hold serious um, concrete and they're still anchored toward fundamentals, that they're still relatable, translatable into 3D modeling. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that'll get you in the door. Uh, there's always a place for someone who's bringing in something new. What is AAA? It's like those crazy big, big ass companies like Bethesda or, or EA Games or not EA Games, a distributor app, just like other other studios um, for, for movies and games. There's 101 versions or 101 names for them. Um, deep voices are sexy. No, they're not. <laughs> um, how long did it take you to get to the point where you're at now? Um, I stayed the same level between like age 15 and, and 18 or 20. Um, well, I, I changed when I started doing real studies, so I've improved in the last three years, I feel like I've improved ten years worth of improvement in three years because of the way I've been studying. Um, I've just uh, started breaking down my studies a little bit more, so it, it did take me longer than usual to get to an, uh, the final point where I finally crossed over from intermediate. Um, but I've been drawing since I was eight years old. And I'm not saying I've been drawing efficiently since I was eight years old. I've been drawing efficiently since I was 20 and I'm 25 right now. Uh, so it's been five years that I've taken it, that, that it's taken this long to be. But I started off as art in art really early. So it really is different for everyone. But since I've been drawing since I was eight years old. So I, there's that answer and then there's 20 years old and there's that answer for you. So, so five years to really push... Um, and I had school. I had lots of school. I took. I, I graduated when I was 22. Um, so I. I. Uh, I guess I really. I didn't really draw. I didn't do studies when I was 20. So that's a lie. I. I drew random masterpieces like on reading week or holidays. So I. I started doing the crazy form studies. Like my earliest form studies submitted on DeviantArt was when I was probably 23. So three years of form studies, pretty much. Not every day. Just for three or two or three months a year, all I would do is form studies whenever I didn't know what to draw. <laughs> Again, it's really vague and it's different for everyone. Um, I, I hate the whole just draw advice. There's definitely faster ways to study and improve. Absolutely, studying efficiency, that's what I'm always talking about. I've been drawing for eight months and I'm 27. You can do it. There's age is, means nothing. Age means nothing if you're studying efficiently. What do you recommend to me as a very as a beginner to improve my skills in the most effective way? Because um, your videos, I'm into character design and anime. Um, 
I recommend uh, basic portrait anatomy if you want to get into character design and uh, portrait anatomy between male and female so focus on that and just so that you can get employed earlier and start seeing a benefit from your art so you can get employed, employed in private and um, freelance work but for the bigger picture to build your portfolio for a bigger employer um, talking about studios and stuff I recommend doing the basics understanding basic form rules basic sciences so that you can make an object look like it really exists in a 3d space so modeling without the 3d modeling program that's what you guys want to do you want to model without the 3d modeling program you are missing a dimension you have to invent the third dimension you have to bring it in and and project it um, in a false environment that, 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 that can't possibly sustain a third dimension. It's a canvas that's only got two dimensions. So learning how to model without a 3D modeling program is what's going to make you better no matter what you're trying to what you're trying to work for. <clears throat> can you see can you see my older artwork? Yes, absolutely. But um, it's all stuck in my um, in my in my expansion drive that I still haven't managed to fix. Uh, I, I don't know how to fix it. It's a Seagate expansion drive with one terabyte or 300 gigabytes I forget but it blew up on me some years ago or a year ago or so I think two years ago so I haven't been able to access my first commission stuff that I drew when I was 18 the dumbest drawings you've ever seen in your life I want to show them to you guys so badly but it's just stuck there in the boiler room and I'm just leaving it there like there's no way I can fix it <clears throat> Is it a good idea to draw on paper first, then scan to paint over in Photoshop? Yeah, that's fine. If you're more comfortable with lines on traditional work. Just remember, you have to replace your lines. You can't keep them. I started drawing very late in life, but I feel like I've started to improve very quickly because I study efficiently and often. Absolutely. Remember, improvement is exponential. It's not day by day, plus one, plus one, plus one, and then you have three, 365 points at, at the end of the year. No, you will you will reach a you know, multiplication of that. Uh, you will improve exponentially. You will get way better than you ever imagined possible if you're just doing it every day. At one point, you're just going to break through, and every study will be like a masterpiece. They'll be pretty studies. They won't be bad studies anymore. They'll be good-looking studies. And that's when you know you're ready for masterpieces. College, it was always masterpiece for every period. Just now, I'm able to take a step back and really learn and practice. It's a good. It's good. It's so good too to have courses like yours. I'm happy mine help you. Uh, could you do a video fixing your old artwork for fun? Katie Ritchie asks. I All I do is fix old artwork. So everything that I'm doing now, like painting over, using liquify, using multiply, using uh, layer modes, that's all ways to improve an already existing image. So everything that I'm doing here, you guys can just do it. Get a new layer, erase away what you don't want, fix the lighting, find the light source, find the cube. Um, all of that stuff is ways to improve your old work. Um, but maybe I can make a video about it if I find my old files. She won't show her early art because it's mostly furry art. <laughs> I don't do furry art. I'm sorry. I, I don't I don't like furry art. I hate furry art. I'm sorry. I know some of you like it. And everyone has their thing, but I just don't get furry art. I don't like furry art. So zing. <laughs> um, how to get used to pen tablets. With time, Light Runner. Just give it some time. But you gotta learn cinematography and storytelling, though. Absolutely, there's a lot of stuff you gotta learn. Art is not, um, you know, you're not exempt from other schools of thought. You're not exempt from other practices. You're gonna have to learn a lot about medicine. You're gonna have to learn a lot about literature and the history of costumes, the history of props, what they say. You gotta learn a lot about cinematography and photography and how to stage um, a canvas, a horizontal or vertical canvas. There's a lot of stuff you have to learn, but with mileage, you eventually get all of that. At the end of the day, it's just drawing enough, and that is the answer that I avoid using, but that's an answer that I'll use for this. There's a lot of stuff you're going to have to just become familiar with. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a great day. Bye-bye.